On the 21st of July 2018, the crew of the historic DC-3 aircraft Blue Bonnet Bell pushed up the throttles in Burnett, Texas to head to Oshkosh, Wisconsin with a fuel stop planned in between. The aircraft was heavily loaded and the pilot in the right seat was newly type rated in the DC-3. Less than 10 seconds into the takeoff roll, things began to go very wrong and seconds later the aircraft ended up in a flaming ball of wreckage off to the left side of the runway. All 13 crew members survived, six with serious injuries. The final NTSB report indicates that there was nothing wrong with the aircraft. It's Thursday, the 3rd of December. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. It's time for an update. The loss of the Blue Bonnet Bell is the first of a series of three Warbird accidents that has the entire Living History Flight Experience FAA exemption, which allows these Warbirds to fly and to fly passengers who are willing to donate money towards the flight to keep these aircraft restored and flying under scrutiny by the FAA and the flying public. Though we have the final report on Blue Bonnet Bell, we're still waiting for the final NTSB report on the B-17 crash, 909, and the recent B-25 crash, Old Glory, near Stockton, California. While we wait reports from those last two accidents, from this final NTSB report from Blue Bonnet Bell, we see that it's less of an issue of the aircraft itself and more of an issue of training and training, pilot training management. So let's go inside and see what happened. Okay, let's review the Matt Gallagher video footage of the actual incident. Adult language will be heard in the background. It's history right there, boys. Oh, shit. Drifting to the right. Holy shit! Falling. Holy shit! Oh, f Holy Now we'll look at the post-crash fire. Everybody got out. That was a miraculous egress. loss of the airframe. So what did the crew do wrong on Blue Bonnet Bell? Here's an example of how to properly fly a DC-3 takeoff. A DC-3, of course, is a tail dragger aircraft, conventional geared aircraft with a tail wheel in the rear. You need to get the tail of the DC-3 up into the air in order to maintain directional control of the aircraft by getting the rudder up into the slipstream. You also need to get the tail up in the air to get the angle of attack of the wing correct into the relative wind before you achieve flying speed. Again, this is the Springbok DC-3. Video compliments of Zinger, Aviation Media. Now this is a much lighter weight DC-3 takeoff than the Blue Bonnet Bell, but right away the tail is up. The rudder is in the slipstream. Otherwise, the rudder and the tail is blanked out completely by the wings of the DC-3. We'll see that in the landing. Good directional control with the rudder and the air, the airfoil of the wings have achieved flying speed. 
Rotate, not until after you've achieved safe single engine operating speed. Now let's take a look at the landing and you can see just how blanked out the tail gets on a DC-3 once it's on the ground, the tail is on the ground. Our hero Dan Greider again <laughs> on short final. Gonna do a wheel landing, planting the mains on first, maintaining directional control with the rudder in the slipstream. Left wheel down, that's a slight left crosswind landing. One wheel landing. Right main down. And look how far you can push that nose over. No problem in the DC-3. Continue to fly that tail. The tail wheel is locked. So that once the tail wheel, once the tail comes down, right there at a very slow speed, the aircraft continues to track straight ahead, but look how blanked out the tail is on the DC-3 once it's back in the three-point position. Now let's look at some videos that demonstrate the power on stalling characteristic of the DC-3. This is a classic DC-3 video that's been around for years on the internet, a mid-90s skydiving incident in which the pilot not only stalled the DC-3, but spun it completely. Now, in this skydiving incident, of course, we have some additional factors. We've got too many skydivers uh, in the aft of the aircraft, too much drag on the aircraft. The skydiving aircraft is dropping the divers with the gear down. But check out what happens here. If you haven't seen this already, this really demonstrates the kind of wicked power on stalling characteristics of the DC-3 and why it takes so much room to recover from a DC-3 stall. The skydive, look at that, full left spin. Now, he's got pro spin rudder in the thing and up elevator, and then he stops the spin and begins to recover the aircraft. All the skydivers are thrown free of the airplane. Let's take another look at that at a slower motion. That's looking at the fuselage of the DC-3. Skydiver's hanging off the edge there. And right away there, off to the rodeo, spitting out the skydivers. There you can see pro spin rudder and up elevator. So it's definitely <laughs> going to spin in that situation. The spin, of course, is a prohibited maneuver in the DC-3. These guys got it to recover relatively quickly. Remember, the DC-3 has no stall warning horn. It only has the built-in buffet of the stall to warn the pilot that the aircraft is, in fact, stalling. Here's a shot from inside the aircraft. Let's see what happens here. Everybody's moving aft. The aircraft's flying slow. They want a slow speed for the departure of the skydivers. Now, moving your CG too far aft, even though it slightly decreases, <laughs> they all go, they got to go, slightly decreases your stall speed. It also decreases the stability of the aircraft, the longitudinal stability of the aircraft, making it easier to stall the aircraft with an aft CG. You lose that feel in the elevator telling you that you're about to stall the aircraft. Normally when you stall an aircraft, it takes a pretty good pull on the yoke to horse it into a stall. If you have an aft CG, that amount of pull required on the control yoke to stall the aircraft is reduced, making it easier to stall the aircraft, even though the stall speed is slightly reduced with an aft CG. Now let's go to the absolute original source material, the late 1930s NACA, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, before NASA was invented, we had NACA, demonstrating the stall characteristics of the DC-3. This is 1937, September 1937, Langley Field, Virginia. So they attached silk tufts to the leading edge of the wing so you can see the stall progress. And what we want to see in a power-on stall is how the stall progresses from the wing tip 
just the opposite of what you really want. You really want the stall to progress from the wing root so that you maintain some aileron control and that you get a good buffeting pre-indication that you're about to stall the aircraft before the aircraft just dropping off on a wing. So they slowed the frame rate down. And there the whole entire wing just about stalls at once. At least the whole entire outboard portion of the wing stalling at once in a power-on stall configuration. Remember, we're talking two different types of, pow of stalls, power-on stalls and power-off stalls. It's the power-on stall characteristic, like we witnessed with Blue Bonnet Bell, that NACA is most interested in studying on the DC-3. Why does the DC-3 power-on stall typically result in a tip stall? I believe it's because of the way the engines are mounted on the DC-3 at full power. Those engines are producing quite a bit of lift over the wing root area of the wing, allowing the wing tip to stall first and the wing root to stall later. Even with the one to one and a half degrees of washout built into the DC-3 wing. Power off stalls, the stalls in the DC-3 are quite conventional. They stall at the wing root first and then the stall progresses out towards the wing tip in a power off stall in the DC-3. This is the mighty Luscom, a 1947 Luscom 8A with the O200 conversion, rag wing model, and this aircraft has built-in wash out to help prevent tip stalls. Let me show you. In order to get a nice stall characteristic and stall warning, natural stall warning you want the stall to occur at the wing roots first and then progress out towards the wing tips that also gives you a bit of lateral control at slow flight in order to achieve that the wings have a built-in warp or washout here at the wing tip you can see that the wing is twisted such that the leading edge is slightly lower here at the wing tip than it is at the wing root the trailing edge is slightly higher, so the wing tip has a slightly lower angle of attack than does the wing root. That allows the wing to stall first at the wing root, and the stall will eventually progress out to the wing tip, giving you plenty of buffet over the horizontal tail to warn you of the impending stall. Because again, there is no stall warning horn or light or indicator on these early aircraft. It's all done through natural aerodynamic characteristics. On the metal wing Luscombs, that amount of wash in is built into the wing when the wing is jigged up and constructed. Here on the fabric models, this washout is adjusted right here by extending the length of this strut bolt that adds additional twist or wash out to the wing. Now let's read from the NTSB report and this will lay out the chain of events that occurred long before the crew pushed up the throttles. On July 21st, 2018, about 9.15 Central Daylight Time, a Douglas DC-3 airplane, November 47 Hotel Lima, was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Burnett, Texas. The pilot, crew chief, four passengers, and four passengers sustained serious injuries, one passenger sustained minor injuries, and the co-pilot and five passengers, five other passengers, were not injured. The aircraft was operated under FAR Part 91, that's General Aviation Rules and Regulations. Representatives from the Commemorative Air Force reported that all the passengers were volunteers of the, at the CAF wing and that the intention of the flight was to travel to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, that's the home of the annual air show and fly-in, with an intermediate fuel stop planned at Sedalia Regional Airport in Sedalia, Missouri. The co-pilot reported that during a discussion with the pilot before the flight, he told the pilot that his time in the airplane was low. He, was, he just received his DC-3 type rating that almost all his tailwheel time was in small airplanes. The pilot replied that he was a 4,000 hour DC-3 pilot and there, were, there weren't going to be any problems. If you could taxi it, you could fly it, he said. This is the pilot, the captain in the left seat. Additionally, they briefed that the co-pilot would conduct the takeoff. So they're going to give the, the guy with the brand new rating 
his first takeoff in a heavily loaded DC-3 aircraft. And that the co-pilot would be the pilot flying and the pilot would be the pilot monitoring. Remember, that's how he normally divvy up the duties. It's not necessarily captain and first officer or pilot and co-pilot. It's pilot flying and pilot monitoring. The pilot stated that the airplane would be heavier than what the co-pilot was used to and that it might be necessary to help get the tail up. He asked the co-pilot if he was comfortable taking off with a heavy airplane and the co-pilot responded that he was. This would be the co-pilot's first shot at flying a heavily loaded DC-3. During all the training, the DC-3 was very lightly loaded. The co-pilot stated that the pilot taxied the airplane to the run-up area where they completed all pre-takeoff checks in the engine run-up. The pilot then taxied the airplane onto runway 19. Subsequently, the co-pilot took control of the airplane, conducted pre-takeoff brief, and initiated the takeoff sequence. After the aircraft began to move, he applied some forward pressure on the control yoke. The pilot told him that he was applying the pressure too early. So he then slightly relaxed the forward pressure on the control yoke. About 10 seconds into the takeoff roll, the airplane began to drift right, at which time the co-pilot applied left rudder input, followed shortly after by the pilot in the left seat, the captain in the left seat, taking control of the airplane. Now the report backs up a little bit. The captain reported that after taxiing into the runway, he didn't like the way things looked, so he unlocked the tailwheel. The DC-3 has a locking tailwheel. That tailwheel is generally in the locked position for takeoff to keep the tail wheel straight until which time that you get the tail up on the DC-3 wind flowing over the rudder for adequate directional control of the DC-3. And of course we all know too that you got to get the tail up on the DC-3 to get the wing to fly. To get the correct angle of attack on the wing. Let's see, so he unlocked the tail wheel, let the airplane roll forward six or seven inches, relocked the tail wheel and verified it was locked. The pilot couldn't recall whether during the initial stages of the takeoff roll if the airplane swerved right, but he did recall telling the co-pilot not to push the tail up because it was heavy and that the airplane then swerved left. He then yelled, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. Shortly thereafter, he said, my airplane, and then took control of the airplane. This is the captain, the pilot in the left seat. As he put his hands on the control yoke, he noticed that either the tail had started to lower or that the main wheels had just lifted off the ground. He knew the airplane was slow, so he tried to ease it back over to the runway and set it back down, and then he felt the shudder of a stall, and the airplane rolled left and impacted the ground. After the airplane came to a stop, a post-impact fire ensued, and all the airplane occupants egressed through the aft left door. And that was a miraculous egress. The pilot, the captain in the left seat, reported over 4,500 hours of experience in tailwheel aircraft, and the pilot last flew the DC-3 about one month prior to the accident. The co-pilot reported that he had just completed his DC-3 type rating training in May of 2018. Again, the accident is in July of 2018 which included eight hours in the DC-3 and 1.6 hours for a pilot-in-command checkride. He added that during this training, he never sat in the right seat, so all his training was conducted in the left seat. He recalled that the DC-3 was difficult to taxi, but he felt that he never had any issues flying it because all the instrument approaches were standard. However, he did add that takeoffs and landings were something you need to experience with and to practice with. The, the co-pilot then conducted two flights in the accident airplane with a commemorative Air Force unit instructor. He stated that he felt his takeoffs and landings were very different in the accident airplane and that it was more squirrely than the airplane in which he had trained. The CAF unit instructor reported that the accident airplane was empty with just 400 gallons of fuel on board for their first flight and that the co-pilot flew the airplane from the right seat. So the, the co-pilot did get some right seat time before the accident. The co-pilot had no issues in the air. They performed landings and he helped the co-pilot through the systems checklist and procedures. During the second training flight, the instructor performed the first half of the flight with the co-pilot as the pilot flying and the second half of the flight with the co-pilot as the non-flying pilot. The instructor added that the co-pilot had issues with directional control on the ground, including, including that his control 
inputs were lazy inputs similar to those for small airplanes. Remember the DC-3 is a big heavy beast of an airplane with no hydraulic assist at all. All the controls are cable actuated and aerodynamically balanced and these big old airplanes require huge control inputs especially when slow. Oftentimes it takes full control throw to get the desired effect at low air speeds. Lazy inputs similar to those for small airplanes tended to go to the right first and seemed to overcorrect to the left by leaving the control inputs for too long. Remember when dealing with tail dragger aircraft it's more like a boxing match. It's a series of short little jabs to keep things under control. The instructor added that the co-pilot's first flight in the accident aircraft was not satisfactory but that he had shown gradual improvement with directional control during the second flight and he signed off the co-pilot because during the second flight's debrief the co-pilot's attitude was good and his directional control of the aircraft had improved. At the completion of the checkout the instructor said that the co-pilot could take off and land without assistance however he had some concern about his reaction time to a divergence of heading while on the ground. Perfect. Who's this? Blanco. Security, look who it is. Blanco Lario. What are you doing here? Bl Blanco. <laughs> so here today with me today is Dan Grider just came in from uh, Monterey. Uh, North America. North America on his usual North America hobo tour here. But uh, we're talking about the Blue Bonnet Bell today on the Blanco Lirio channel, and I understand the student that's in question, that's in the right seat, got his type rating from you. Yeah, and uh, just real quick, you know, that's that accident happened a couple years ago, and uh, uh, we're coming into the Warbird season again in 2021. The ride hopping thing and uh, a couple things concerning the tail and getting this tail to fly. Um, the problem was I typed the guy that was in the right seat. He was making the takeoff that day. He hadn't ever sat in the right seat because it wasn't required. Mm -hmm. And he had never make, made a max gross takeoff weight because it wasn't Not required. required. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't ever made an aft CG takeoff because it wasn't required. Oh. So the very first takeoff that he made after getting his type rating from me was in the right seat, gross weight, and aft takeoff, mm -hmm. aft CG. Mm -hmm. And you can see what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, they... You have to really aggressively get this tail to fly. Maybe you can show some video of takeoff and landing and, and get, oh, this, yeah, we got it. Yep. get this tail up. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the problem with that. All these warbird operations, they're spending their money on check rides. They should be spending their money and time and effort on training mm -hmm. and practice and getting, and getting these maneuvers down uh, and practicing so they don't hurt people. Uh, you know, the problem is you get a ticket to ride. The fair paying public the unknowing public is buying a ticket on a Warbird. Through the historical exemption. That's the exemption. That's mm -hmm. the right exemption. Mm -hmm. So th that's the problem. If we don't straighten up ourselves and self-police and get a little bit better grip on this, the ride exemption program is going to go away. The FAA will pull us. If we hurt any more people in 2021, the whole thing will mm. be gone for everybody. Mm. Getting the tail up in the DC-3 is critical because the tail's blanked out by the wing, and that's what you need for directional control to get the rudder up in the slipstream. Yeah, and, and rolling down the runway with the tail down, the wing is at a positive angle. It rolls down the runway at 11 degrees, nose up. The wing is actually flying at 11 degrees angle of attack with the tail down. you got to kill that angle of attack by getting the tail in the air where it's effective and killing the angle of attack on the main wing. If you don't, you saw what happened in that video. Show it in slow motion. The tail's still down, and that airplane starts to, to come up off the ground and then stalls and then stalls yeah mm -hmm. so it it began to fly before it was ready to fly yep yep and the dc3 does have kind of a notorious tip stall for power on stalls yeah and but they were they were still in ground effect on this particular one but uh the whole accident sequence was just very very unfortunate it has to do with management oversight mm -hmm. looking at and and prevent and thinking ahead to prevent these scenarios in the future is going to be critical to our existence a lot of these warbird operators exist off the revenue from ride hopping mm -hmm. and if we're going to ride hop and get a ticket to ride we cannot hurt the public we got to do it right great thanks dan